afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Sort of. It's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker for Grand Rounds, Dr. Alan Patinsley, who will be speaking on trends in lung transplantation. Our program is underwritten by an educational grant through Integris Baptist Medical Center, and a disclosure statement has been signed and is on file in the Graduate Medical Education Office. Dr. Patensley is the Medical Director of the Lung Transplantation and Advanced Pulmonary Disease Management at the Nazai Zudi Transplant Institute. Dr. Patensley was a Senior Staff Physician at the Henry Ford Hospital Transplant Institute and an Assistant Professor of Medicine at Wayne State University prior to arriving at NZTI. He completed his Pulmonary Critical Care Fellowship at the University of North Carolina and his internal medicine residency in New Orleans at Tulane University. His honors and awards include the American Respiratory Care Foundation and the IKA RIA Literary Award for Best Manuscript by a First-Time Author. Dr. Patensley graduated with honors from Duke University in 1992 with a degree in biomedical engineering and currently holds professional memberships with the American Association for Respiratory Care, American College of Chest Physicians, American Thoracic Society, American Medical Association, and the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplant. He is board certified in internal medicine, critical care medicine, and pulmonary medicine and his professional interests and experience include lung transplantation, bronchiectasis, and cystic fibrosis, respiratory complications of neuromuscular disease, and non-invasive mechanical ventilation. And it is with a great pleasure to introduce and welcome Dr. Patensley. Okay, thank you. Thank you, I'm honored to uh, be here. Um, so I'll, I'll be uh, speaking about lung transplantation. This is considered a relatively new area in medicine. Um, lung transplants um, were, the first lung transplant was actually um, at the University of Mississippi in uh, 1964, although um, really um, they, they weren't done regularly or successfully um, until uh, the late 1980s. And um, it was the 1990s where um, we started seeing a number of programs. Um, currently, there uh, range from about 55 to 60 active lung transplant programs in the United States. Um, uh, it's one, one program in Oklahoma is uh, in Oklahoma City and in, in Integris. Um, and um, there are about um, 3,000 lung transplants performed worldwide uh, per year. Um, 2,000 of those are in the United States. Okay, so um, this is just an outline of what I'm gonna be speaking about, um, trying to give a general overview of lung transplantation. I think uh, one of the most important areas for, for all physicians to be able to recognize um, you know, who is a candidate uh, for at least an evaluation for lung transplant. Um, and uh, I'll spend a um, fair amount of time on that. A um, little bit of what, um, what I do as a lung transplant physician, um, I will uh, be involved in the donor selection now, the surgical procedure, um, as a pulmonologist, um, I, I don't take part in that. That's done by um, uh, cardiothoracic surgeon. Uh, Postoperative management, um, it's really a multidisciplinary area. Uh, pulmonologists, critical care doctors, um, surgeons, and uh, go over some of the unique aspects of the post-lung transplant patient, which, will, which differentiates them from other post-operative patients. And I'll spend a little bit of time talking about outcomes from lung transplant. Okay, um, starting with uh, candidates for evaluation. Um, one of the mo uh, four most important characteristics that we look at, um, age, diagnosis, comorbidity, and severity of illness. And what, what we're looking for are um, candidates who have severe enough disease um, to warrant the risk of lung transplant because even um, with the, uh, the best techniques, best medical care, um, one year survival rates uh, range from about 85 to 90 percent 
five-year survival rates range somewhere from usually I think 50 to 60 percent and um, you know so so you definitely want your patients to be severe enough to warrant uh, that type of risk but on the other hand um, we do have to uh, make sure our patients aren't too sick so we look at the uh, age comorbidities and um, that, that can factor in um, trying to identify who's a patient who has severe enough lung disease but is otherwise at least healthy enough to be able to get through and recover from the surgery. Um, okay, so, uh, so this chart here um, shows age distribution of uh, lung transplant. This uh, actually dates all the way back to January of 1985, uh, considered the modern era of lung transplant. And uh, you can see here um, the most common age group is uh, between 55 and 59 years old. Um, and it really uh, drops off here as you get into the uh, greater than 65. Um, so in this total period, um, only about 5% of lung transplant recipients are over the age of 65. Um, now this slide here actually breaks it down into uh, different eras. Um, you can see here in the 1980s, um, uh, th this is data compiled by International Society of Heart Lung Transplant. Um, this includes uh, trans uh, all transplant centers in the United States, uh, Europe, and um, Australia, um, and, and a few other countries uh, that report their data individually. Um, it, um, it tries to accumulate almost all the worldwide data on lung transplant, and you can see here that um, there were only 327 transplants done during that uh, early period, 85 to 89, really was in the 1990s where um, they start becoming more, co um, more common. If you look here, um, data since 2006, and um, you know, that, that, that actually, um, there was a, a change in the way we uh, allocate organs. Um, it actually took place in uh, 2005. Um, the lung allocation score was developed. Part of the lung allocation score Lungs were allocated based essentially on a first come, first serve basis. And um, that uh, was fairly good for patients with COPD who may be sick but had somewhat stable disease and could afford to wait a year, two years, sometimes even longer until they get uh, priority and get transplanted. It didn't work really well for patients with uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, IPF. Often those patients at the time of referral to lung transplant uh, would be uh, have progressive disease, may only have six months or a year or even less to live, and wouldn't be able to survive long enough to get high enough on the waiting list. Um, so the lung allocation score um, takes into consideration diagnosis and certain characteristics for severity of illness, and essentially is looking at expected survival with a transplant relative to the expected survival without a transplant. So um, the patients that will have the highest score, you know, would be ones that are uh, very sick and uh, expecting a very short survival without transplant, but otherwise have uh, minimal comorbidities and would be expected to do very well with the transplant. And essentially to find that sick patients with IPF will usually have very high lung allocation scores and will have much shorter waits than some of the uh, more stable patients with COPD and it seemed to uh, balance the playing field. And actually, um, since that time, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, IPF has uh, become actually the most common diagnosis for lung transplant. Um, what you see here though in recent years, um, uh, we go up to 10% uh, of uh, lung transplant recipients are over age 65. And actually that number, um, in, is actually increasing even further to uh, where, where some centers, you're probably seeing 25 to 30 percent of their recipients are over age 65. And um, as you, um, you basically look, look at this chart here, you can see how in the more recent years, um, we're seeing more older patients that are getting successfully transplanted, 10 percent over 65, almost 20 percent. 5% here um, over age 60, and um, you know that, that's a big change from uh, 
what you've seen previously here, even just going back into the late 90s on this low over 10% um, would be over age 60, and then just really a handful over age 65. So it's really changed the, the uh, face of the transplant. Um, often it was uh, quoted that age 65 was the upper limit for single lung transplants, age 60 for double lung transplants, um, but uh, th those numbers have really changed and we really look at how much um, is the patient going to benefit from the transplant um, you know, versus what is the risk. And so a lot of um, 65, 70, e even in our, our center where uh, we accept up to age 75, um, there are some centers that, you know, in certain instances would even uh, transplant older patients. But at, at that point, you're definitely looking at some patients with, um, you know, who have usually progressive disease with IPF and uh, short life expectancy without the transplant, but otherwise um, a relatively good condition without comorbidities and would be expected to do reasonably well. Okay, um, and this just focuses in a little bit more in that, that older age group. So you can, you can see, again, um, stratified by era. Um, it's really after 2006 where you're starting to see a lot of these older patients um, be referred to and be able to get a transplant. Um, now, of course, th this slide here, um, th this uh, always brings up some concern. This is all you know, retrospective data from the ISHLC database. And this, um, this is all uh, transplants. This is you know, pretty modern from uh, 2000 to 2012. And um, now the numbers do get smaller as far as the number of patients transplanted, but you do see, um, you know, it can be almost up to um, 1.5 uh, hazard ratio for um, uh, mortality at one year. Um, so, so that does always uh, bring, us a, bring up a concern even, and, and really even as you get over age 55, um, there, there is that, uh, that higher mortality. So that's where we definitely want to be more selective with the older patients to uh, try to avoid patients who have other risk factors. Okay, um, this is another way to look at um, survival in the different age groups, and uh, this looks, you know, at the um, longevity um, using Kaplan-Meier curve, um, and you can actually see here this yellow line is greater than age 65, and um, you actually see a little bit less than 40% survival at, at, at five years, um, and definitely um, when we start looking at things like 10-year survival, um, that, get, that gets pretty low. Um, the uh, younger patients, 18 to 34, those are usually patients, mostly patients with cystic fibrosis. They really, when we kind of look at the uh, long-term survival, 10 years, you know, they have almost a 40% 10 year survival. So it, it actually makes it very difficult to quote these statistics uh, when evaluating an individual patient uh, for transplant because um, you, you have such a wide range where there's a very real chance that the candidate may not even survive one year um, with a transplant, even in the youngest age group, um, actually one year survival. And if you take all these patients, it's 80%. Nowadays, it's probably a little bit higher. But, um, you know, when you go back to 1990, you actually have about a one in five risk of dying within the first year. Um, but then, you know, those patients also have about two in five chance of living 10 years or more. So um, it, it can be very hard to predict um, what the outcome is going to be. Okay, um, so next I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the uh, different diagnoses. Um, uh, I mentioned earlier IPF um, and the era with lung allocation score. That's been become the most common indication for lung transplant. Um, COPD uh, historically had been most common, um, but now that um, ranks for low IPF, and specifically it seems that the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency patients uh, often will uh, develop uh, more severe COPD at younger ages, so that actually becomes a significant subset. Um, cystic fibrosis, that usually is about 20% of all lung transplant candidates, and uh, still with, a, you know, even though medical therapy has improved for cystic fibrosis, inevitably uh, all patients with cystic fibrosis do seem to develop uh, respiratory failure often at, at under age, younger ages. So 
um, almost all can, uh, patients with cystic fibrosis can at some point be potential lung transplant candidates. Um, pulmonary arterial hypertension is kind of interesting. Um, back in the early 1990s, lung transplant uh, was really only effective therapy. Um, I actually uh, just yesterday um, saw a patient in my clinic who um, had pulmonary hypertension and um, she was transplanted at University of Pittsburgh, I, I believe in uh, 1991 or 1992, which uh, makes her about 23 years post lung transplant. Um, you know, at the time, um, actually this was uh, before Flowland was on the market and uh, we were talking yesterday, she, she mentioned that um, she was going to be a candidate to be started on Flowland probably as part of a, a clinical trial at the same time that she was listed for lung transplant. Um, she happened to get transplanted and, um, you know, it definitely is unusual um, to see you know, 20 plus year survival after lung transplant, but, um, you know, that was at a time when uh, there actually was no uh, good medical therapy for pulmonary hypertension. Nowadays, um, as you probably know, there are a number of drugs on the market to uh, manage pulmonary hypertension, and actually the number of patients that are transplanted for PAH has gone down to probably only about 5% of all lung transplants. Many of those patients can do well with medical therapy. Okay, um, this is a somewhat complicated slide here, um, but uh, the key points um, are looking at single versus uh, bilateral transplants and um, also the total number. So you can see here that um, you know, when you go back to 1995, um, still COPD in total has been the most common indication, about one out of three lung transplants. And, uh, and then um, also IPF and cystic fibrosis are the other uh, common uh, diagnoses. Um, and then as far as single versus double transplants, uh, CF patients almost always get double lung transplants uh, due to the uh, chronic infection. Um, IPF patients uh, really can go either way and um, they seem to often do very well with, with only single lung transplant. Um, COPD patients are different advantages and disadvantages of single versus double, um, but uh, as you can see, um, they uh, often can get either one. Um, this is just another way of looking at these major indications by year. Um, so if you look at this uh, blue here, that's uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension. So as I was mentioning in the early 90s, um, when you didn't have any uh, effective medical therapy, that uh, those patients were more commonly transplanted. But um, if you go into recent years, um, it's become a small group. Um, uh, it actually turns out alpha-1 antitrypsin disease, um, uh, the numbers have gone down as well. Um, COPD um, really has uh, stayed somewhat stable. Um, IPF, uh, you, you see a little bit of an upward trend in uh, cystic fibrosis, um, you know, seem, seems to be just under 20%, but that, that really hasn't changed. This just um, looks at the total number of transplants, and uh, again, you can see here, um, most common, um, especially in 2012, you have uh, COPD, IPF, and cystic fibrosis. Um, this here um, looks at survival based on diagnosis. And uh, now earlier we, we looked at a similar type of Kaplan-Meier curve that's stratified by age. And of course, um, you know, there is, you know, the cystic fibrosis patients in general are, are younger. Um, fibrosis patients in general are older. So um, it, it's not surprising that when you uh, look at the Kaplan-Meier curve um, for IPF, um, you can see that one, especially when you get out to you know, five or more years, they have the lowest survival. And um, I think especially as we start transplanting older patients with IPF, um, inevitably the long-term survival, we're not going to see 20 plus years of survival in a 75-year-old with IPF who gets a lung transplant. That's just probably not going to happen. But um, you know, when we transplant a 19-year-old with cystic fibrosis, it is you know, very possible. Um, and, and here you, you can see, um, again, looking at even you know, 10 year survival for cystic fibrosis, that's over 40%. Okay. Um, now, uh, going on a little bit about comorbidities. So, um, you know, th these are things that uh, 
increased risk. They make the transplant more difficult. Times have really changed where in the early days of transplant, uh, some of these things would be absolute contraindication. Um, surgeons were more conservative. We didn't know as much about transplant. Uh, in more recent years, I think uh, the criteria is broadened and we're willing to accept patients with more different uh, comorbidities and still get successful transplants. Um, things that we consider are uh, prior malignancy, um, advanced dysfunction of major organ systems, infection, and then psychosocial issues really um, become an important issue. We see a fair amount of patients that have problems because of it can be difficulty keeping track of medications, it can be inability to come for clinic visits, um, a number of different things can end up uh, causing problems. And I always tell our patients that uh, lung transplants is actually fairly difficult to take good care of it, but um, if you want to live a long time, you really have to pay close attention. And um, the, the patients that do pay attention to detail um, seem to be able to uh, do better and avoid complications. So here, here are some comorbidities that um, you know often are used as absolute contraindications. Um, uh, uh, colonization with highly resistant organisms that usually um, is uh, Burkholderia cetacea in cystic fibrosis patients. Um, obesity, uh, numbers uh, vary as far as what centers will accept. Um, it used to be a BMI of 30 uh, would be the maximum acceptable. A lot of centers consider BMI up to 35 or sometimes even, even higher than that. And it really depends on the patient. We, you know, again, we look at severity of illness. So um, a patient with IPF who's uh, rapidly declining with a BMI of 35 may be considered a good candidate because the alternative to transplant um, you know, would be death and they may not have enough time to lose weight. A stable COPD patient with a BMI of 35 may have plenty of time to exercise and lose weight. So that patient, uh, we may uh, require that uh, they try to lose weight before they would be a candidate. Um, Severe symptomatic osteoporosis um, that is sometimes looked at, although I think a lot of the patients with the recurrent steroid use age will have osteoporosis and still can be successfully transplanted. Uh, mechanical ventilation, uh, um, that, that is an area of a little bit of controversy. Um, uh, patients can do well um, being transplanted for mechanical ventilation. I've had uh, you know, experiences with, um, with patients who uh, had to wait on a mechanical ventilator for almost six months before being transplanted. Uh, the, the key was um, these were younger patients with cystic fibrosis who um, you know, were actually able to ambulate daily uh, while either using a portable ventilator or a bag of hand. They really had a single uh, system organ dysfunction. So young patient without other comorbidities with just uh, respiratory failure um, who's requiring mechanical ventilation if they can uh, stay in reasonably good physical condition can be successful. Also, um, patients who acutely decompensate who are on a mechanical ventilator um, can often be uh, transplanted successfully. It, it's probably the in-between group um, where they've been on the ventilator for a few weeks. Um, they're too sick to be able to do a tracheostomy and get them up and walking, and, but they've been on the ventilator for more than just a few days. So those are the ones that uh, probably aren't going to be good candidates. Um, these are other comorbidities that are looked at, but usually not considered contraindications. Coronary artery disease um, is managed differently at different institutions. Um, uh, some surgeons will actually do a, uh, do a cabbage at the time of lung transplant. Um, when I was in uh, Michigan at Henry Ford Hospital, that was um, kind of a common strategy for us was um, to do cabbage at the time of transplant. Um, at uh, Integris and probably more commonly at other hospitals, we try to um, often do uh, percutaneous uh, uh, procedures. Um, one of the issues with that often becomes the, um, the antiplatelet agents that uh, are required after a stent and Michigan bleeding, um, but um, that, that uh, can be dealt with easily. So this, uh, of course, uh, th this came from uh, consensus statement. It was uh, 
in the um, journal Heart and Lung Transplant, uh, just recently published. Um, it's an update. The uh, previous one was in 2006. Um, you can see here, I just uh, put in, in kind of small print to fit everything in. There are a lot of things that can be considered, you know, contraindication. I think um, some of these are somewhat obvious. Um, active TB infection, um, uncorrectable bleeding diathesis, um, non-adherence to medical therapy. Um, so really mostly absolute contraindications. Um, now this uh, recent history of malignancy, that actually will even depend on the malignancy. Um, some low-grade prostate cancer, post-prostatectomy, uh, at times for sick patients, you know, may be willing to transplant those relatively soon afterwards, um, you know, factoring in the low risk of recurrence, whereas um, patient with lung cancer, even a stage one transposed resection, uh, is typically going to be a significant wait time before they would be considered gametes. In general, uh, historically, um, five years has been um, considered uh, wait time for patients with considered cured malignancies, um, although a uh, number of people are actually considering patients with two years post-treatment malignancy, um, things like breast cancers, uh, et cetera. Um, and then definitely for some of these low-grade malignancies, bladder cancers, prostate cancers, uh, I've had experience where uh, we've been willing to have much shorter wait periods due to the low risk of recurrence. Um, skin cancers actually um, for basal cells, uh, skin cancer, and uh, the squamous cell usually don't require any significant wait period. It's the uh, melanomas that would be more concerning. Um, so looking at severity of illness, this is uh, the area where we want our we need our patients to be severe enough to warrant a risk of lung transplant, but not so severe that uh, we think that they're not going to survive it. Um, and this, I just compared um, the statements that this was in 2006, the previous consensus statement. They used uh, the wording, lung transplantation is indicated for patients with chronic end-stage lung disease who are failing maximal medical therapy or for, no, for whom no effective medical therapy exists. Um, that actually is probably a little bit, uh, I, I think, a better statement because um, now they put uh, things like 50% risk of death from lung disease within two years if lung transplantation is not performed. Um, it's a little bit more difficult when you're trying to um, calculate these uh, mortality risks. 80% uh, likelihood of surviving at least 90 days after lung transplant. Um, I actually... Uh, prefer some of these. These statements, I think, that's a little bit more clear. Early referral for consideration of transplant is highly desirable. I think that's probably one of the most important things for referring physicians. Um, if somebody's referred for consideration for lung transplant too early, it usually isn't any harm. They may be uh, followed. They may have, you know, more end up having some unnecessary testing done and, you know, they may be watched or there's waiting for a long time. Um, but on the other hand, um, if they're uh, referred too late for a transplant, sometimes they may not survive long enough to go through its uh, somewhat difficult workup, and um, that's definitely more of a problem. Next slide. Um, and this is kind of a new area. It's uh, mechanical bridges to transplant. Uh, ECLS stands for extracorporeal life support, which um, otherwise, you know, we kind of think as ECMO. And um, I've had uh, some, some experience, um, actually recently at Integris, um, we've uh, kind of expanded our ECMO program with, um, we brought in uh, a few new physicians um, who uh, have a lot of experience with ECMO. Um, we've had uh, two patients so far that uh, were pretty sick and uh, we were attempting to bridge the transplant with ECMO but, um, and, and they actually do ambulatory awake ECMO where they were um, on the ECMO extubated and uh, able to get up and walk. Um, the first two that, that we've tried uh, had different issues and, and, and neither ended up actually listed for lung transplant. But it's something that I know is done at, at a number of institutions um, and has been done successfully, but uh, you have to be very careful in uh, proper 
candidate selection. Um, and this is just some general guidelines. Um, really uh, basic things that you know we look at in general. Um, you know, other severe comorbidities, probably um, it's not a good idea to try to bridge somebody to transplant with ECMO. Uh, young patients, it's good rehab potential and uh, absence of multiple organ dysfunction. It probably um, it can be done successfully. Uh, we did have a, a patient um, about a year and a half ago who um, actually needed a retransplant. He a young patient with cystic fibrosis. His first graft was failing. Um, we ended up having to transfer him to University of Pittsburgh, and uh, they they were able to um, support him with a device called dextrocorporeal CO2 removal. It's not actually um, FDA approved in the United States yet, but um, they uh, supported him with that um, and were able to successfully transplant him. Okay, so um, part two, um, I'll just go in a little bit about uh, donor selection. This is something that um, is usually done either by the uh, pulmonary transplant physician or the uh, surgeon. And uh, in general, these are the things we look at, age, tobacco use. Um, we look at blood gases for the CO2 to FiO2 ratio. You know, we'll look at a chest x-ray, um, we'll look at the bronchoscopy and gram chains of uh, respiratory secretions. Um, those are kind of the major factors that, that we look at. Uh, right now, only about 20% of potential organ donors actually end up having their lungs utilized for transplant. And, you know, that's an area where um, we're constantly looking for ways to be able to utilize more organs. Um, one of the ways uh, that uh, some centers have expanded the donor pool, um, we haven't yet done this in Integris. Um, uh, donation after cardiac death uh, can be done um, successfully with lungs. And then uh, ex vivo lung perfusion, um, that's, that's kind of an interesting area. Um, it's a device um, that it actually was just recently uh, received an FDA approval. Um, and um, so EVLP, ex vivo lung perfusion, basically um, the explanted lungs are uh, perfused by um, this uh, solution um, such as the Christine solution that uh, was developed um, in, in Scandinavia. And um, so these lungs are actually ventilated and perfused, and um, you can actually uh, monitor them. Um, it's thought that uh, marginal lungs may actually uh, be suitable um, if the CO2 to FiO2 ratio is low, and it happens to be from pulmonary edema or anelectasis that uh, typically can uh, resolve once they're um, put on the ex vivo lung perfusion. Um, it's thought that uh, some of the inflammation can actually decrease during the time on ex vivo lung perfusion. Some of the more interesting areas um, that uh, haven't been done routinely but have been explored are actually treating infections with ex uh, while on ex vivo lung perfusion or uh, removing a pulmonary emboli. Um, th those are things that uh, uh, some centers have considered uh, doing. So the ex vivo lung perfusion gives you the ability to consider lungs for transplant that otherwise would have been uh, discarded. Surgical procedure, um, back in the early days, um, heart-lung transplant in the 1980s was really uh, the most common type of transplant. Um, then uh, the single lung transplant uh, was done. And then um, the sequential bilateral lung transplant was developed. And uh, what that means is that the lungs can be transplanted you can do a double lung transplant without the use of cardiopulmonary bypass. So um, usually if, there is, if the patient does not have severe pulmonary hypertension after uh, clamping one pulmonary artery, um, the anesthesiologist can ventilate a single lung and um, you can transplant one lung. Once that lung is in, you ventilate the transplanted lung and um, uh, transplant the other lung and it allows uh, double lung transplants to usually be done without the use of cardiopulmonary bypass. Um, in situations of pulmonary hypertension, um, what often happens is once uh, you uh, clamp one of the pulmonary arteries, um, you may uh, have uh, right atrial venous failure, and those patients need to go on cardiopulmonary bypass. And as far as the uh, type of uh, incision, uh, traditionally it's been the uh, clamshell incision, and this is kind of a demonstration. Basically, the incision 
goes all the way across his chest and horizontally through the sternum. Uh, sometimes there can be issues with um, healing of the sternum or problems there. Um, and, and some surgeons, although it is more difficult, um, will actually do uh, bilateral um, anterolateral thoracotomy without actually uh, bicep being sewn. And then this slide here, it just uh, shows the distribution of procedure type. And one of the uh, things uh, you'll, you'll notice here, in general, um, back in the 90s, um, you know, seven out of 10 COPD transplants were single lung transplants. If you move to 2012, you actually needed that uh, flipped and uh, about seven out of 10 are double. Um, you look at pulmonary fibrosis, eight out of 10 were single. Now it's actually 60-40 in favor of double. Um, cystic fibrosis and pulmonary hypertension are, have always usually been double lung transplants. But um, the trend uh, nowadays is to do more double lung transplants and single lung transplants. Um, the advantage of a double lung transplant is um, looking at retrospective data, there is a slightly better survival um, for the double lung transplants. But on the other hand, as far as utilization of donor organs, um, you can do two single lung transplants from one donor, and that can help uh, decrease the number of patients that actually die on the waiting list without receiving organs. Um, and, and this um, just kind of looks at uh, that same data in a different way. And you can see, um, especially with IPF and COPD, the changing trend um, where the um, majority were single lung transplants and now the majority are double. Um, this, uh, this here, um, so this looks at uh, survival by procedure type. One of the problems is this is retrospective data. So um, if we're typically uh, taking sicker, older patients and choosing intentionally to do a single lung transplant on a sicker, older patient, and in younger, healthier patients doing double lung transplants, um, you're, you're going to see this kind of difference. You saw earlier slides, younger patients had better long-term survival, cystic fibrosis patients had better long-term survival. Well, cystic fibrosis patients also always, or just about always get double lung transplants. So I, I think um, you know it distorts this data a little bit, um, but if you just look at the raw data here, you can see a five-year survival rate for doubles about 55%. And then um, you know, median actually um, would be 7.1 versus 4.6. And that's um, sometimes used to the argument to do uh, double lung transplant rather than single. Um, and conditional actually uh, just tells you if your patient has survived um, the first year, what is, their, uh, what is the average survival of those patients. And uh, so double lung transplants to get through that first year on average will uh, live about 9.7 years compared to only 6.5 for singles. Okay. Moving on to post-op management. Um, so these are some of the issues you see with uh, lung transplant patients that uh, you, you may not deal with in some of your other patients. Uh, primary graft dysfunction essentially is ARDS. Um, uh, other names for that um, are ischemia reperfusion, in, ischemia reperfusion injury or primary graft failure. Uh, and essentially, um, this ischemia reperfusion, uh, one, uh, the donor lung is taken out of the donor and is packed on ice. This is considered now cold ischemic time where there's no blood flow. Um, that lung or lungs may be transported from one institution to another institution. And that, that can actually be done um, in, in some circumstances uh, over 1,500 miles. Um, the cold ischemic time uh, ideally will be less than six hours, although it's uh, often acceptable to have up to eight hours cold ischemic time. And it basically um, you know, takes into account uh, travel time. And then um, once they re reach the destination, the, the lungs are warmed up and then subjected immediately to uh, blood flow from the donor. And this reperfusion sometimes will then cause injury that uh, would lead to cytokines and inflammation and clinically will uh, look just like ARDS. Um, as far as managing those, um, some of the things that you can see here, ECMO, nitric oxide, 
Um, it's inhaled prostacyclin that we use. These are things that have been studied in ARDS, but um, in some studies with uh, ARDS have not been shown beneficial. Um, one of the uh, major differences, um, well actually I, I look at it as two major differences. One, uh, these are all patients, they were selected for lung transplant usually because of uh, relatively few comorbidities, whereas ARDS patients often can have you know, multiple comorbidities. Um, and uh, the, the other uh, issue is that primary graft dysfunction, we know the specific cause, and in general we know if we can support the patient for about seven days, it will resolve and uh, they will uh, recover and have full, usually be able to have full lung function, whereas uh, with ARDS, um, often there's an infection or other problem that uh, we may not be able to treat, the patient may be septic, and then there are a lot of other issues that um, usually are occurring in the ARDS patients. So um, as far as using ECMO, um, it's really been accepted as um, kind of almost a standard of care in uh, primary graft dysfunction. Um, and some centers actually uh, believe in using ECMO um, fairly early um, to help avoid uh, some barotrauma. And so uh, even if uh, the patients could be ventilated adequately with just using higher pressures or higher distension, they will actually use venovenous ECMO to um, uh, prevent having to use some of that uh, 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 traumatic ventilation. Um, other issues that come up with uh, lung transplants, um, uh, mucociliary clearance, um, probably due to the ischemia reperfusion, uh, the ciliary function um, is poor and really is not effective at least for the first month, possibly even longer. Um, we have a lot of problems with uh, mucus plugging and um, we uh, do a lot of things to try to enhance mucociliary uh, clearance, um, you know, whether it's uh, using um, you know, airflash mucolytic to do 7% saline, um, albuterol you know, may actually improve mucociliary function. Um, we'll um, often um, have to do bronchoscopies to help facilitate and um, extract mucus plugs. Um, and it's, it's something that uh, the management of lung transplant patients will be a little different than other patients because of the impaired uh, cilia. Um, and then of course, um, you know, one of the major things with uh, the transplant is of course they have to be immunosuppressed to prevent rejection. But then because of that immunosuppression, we uh, have certain measures to uh, prevent infections. It was just a, kind of an obvious slide here. This uh, just shows a single lung transplant with primary graft dysfunction and a bilateral. And uh, you, can, you can see it uh, typically would look like an ARDS patient. Okay, um, and this um, kind of uh, mentioned just briefly things that we can do to enhance mucociliary clearance. Okay. Um, so th this is something that um, the uh, transplant physician and pulmonologist usually will um, consider is um, what to use for immunosuppression. And um, so th this slide actually is what is called induction therapy. And the concept of an induction is actually to just prior to implantation of the organ using uh, potent immunosuppression um, to try to uh, prevent um, any type of immune response to the um, transplanted lungs um, and you can and it's actually um, controversial, I wouldn't say controversial, but um, different centers all have different protocols for whether they use induction or they don't use induction. Um, the type of drugs that are used for induction usually are anti-thymocyte globulin, um, the IL-2 receptor antagonist um, that's on the market is azalixumab, and then um, this is CAMPATH or alpazumab. Um, uh, CAMPATH is probably the most potent um, immunosuppressive effect of CAMPATH. It can actually last up to two years. Um, the concern, of course, when you use more potent immunosuppression is that uh, you would have more problems with infection. Um, the uh, most common drug, the uh, basiliximab or Simulex, um, is probably the least potent of these three. It um, prevents activation of uh, lymphocytes by a binding the IL-2 receptor. Um, and that um, is used in uh, almost 40% of the centers. Um, that, that's what we uh, typically use in, in Integris. And 
we, we think it probably uh, reduces the risk of injection, but uh, because of specific gun standards, we have to uh, be aware of risk for the customer. Okay, um, and, and this just looks at, uh, you know, over different time periods, um, you can see the, the slight uh, trend to more use of induction is now slightly over 50%, and um, kind of the uh, less severe, the uh, IL-2 receptor antagonists seem to be um, the drug of choice for induction. Um, you can see the anti-thymocyte globulin, which was about 15% in 2002, has really um, become uh, less desirable. Um, th th this slide here just uh, gives you an idea about uh, how common rejection is. And um, you, you can see, um, let's say, regardless of what is used um, for induction, uh, that's a fairly similar rate. And uh, surprisingly, actually, with CAMPATH, um, you have a little bit higher percentage um, experiencing rejection with PERC gear. But again, you know, these may be somewhat biased as far as um, some centers, uh, you know, certain patients that for different reasons may have a higher risk of an injection, may get CAMPATH induction. But um, in, in general, um, you actually see that uh, it may not uh, make that much of a difference as far as the um, frequency of rejection. Um, this looks at survival here. Um, and so now, um, you know, this actually, when you look at long term, you see that uh, you do have just a slight improvement, um, you know, with induction versus no induction. Um, so, you know, that would be in favor of using something for induction. And I think that's where um, uh, Simulac Bazalixumab, because part of the induction that may cause some of these harms. Um, and now, um, this is actually um, looking at freedom from bronchiolitis and glitterin syndrome. Again, you know, this is considered statistically significant where um, bronchiolitis and glitterin syndrome is considered to have a chronic rejection. Um, it's really uh, probably the biggest limitation to long-term success of lung transplant. And you do just see this small advantage with induction, at least looking at retrospective data. Some other um, confounding factors is induction has been more common in recent years. Outcomes have been slightly better in recent years. So there, there are definitely a number of confounding factors here. Um, some basic stuff. Uh, now, it used to be um, cyclosporin was uh, kind of the uh, most important, the most common drug used for immunosuppression. Nowadays, a typical regimen will use uh, tacrolimus or prograph, um, uh, mycophenolate with cell tap and prednisone. And most lung transplant patients will stay on uh, three drug therapy for lifetime, which is a little bit different than other organ transplants. Um, thought that uh, because of constant exposure to the outside environment, um, the lung actually is stimulated and has stronger immune response. Of course, it also has a higher risk of infection. But we do find that uh, lung transplants uh, do require more immunosuppression than other organs. Um, and um, as far as uh, the way they do it, usually the three drug combo with uh, they use a calcineurin inhibitor, a cell cycle inhibitor, and then a uh, corticosteroid. Um, then this just uh, looks at maintenance of immunosuppression, and you can see um, uh, one, of, one of the main differences over the years, um, the more tacrolimus, less cyclosporin, and then there's been more cell traps and less of azathioprine. Um, and then uh, sirolimus or everolimus, um, that's um, you know, another um, medication that is sometimes deemed to be used sometimes as a substitute for the cell cycle inhibitor. Um, they actually impair wound healing, so they're contraindicated within the first three months after transplant. But um, there, there are some advantageous properties. Um, Sirolimus uh, is also known as rapamycin. It actually was initially discovered as an antimicrobial drug. It does seem to at low doses have some antifungal properties, um, some antiviral properties. Um, we've seen that when uh, Sirolimus is used, um, there's a little bit lower risk of CMV disease, so um, there may be certain situations where after the first three months it would be advantageous to um, 
came upon the drugs through uh, Muhammad. Um, and, and this again just looks at um, you know the immunosuppression at one year versus five years. It's looking at uh, the percent um, experiencing rejection, um, the age group, um, and then actually the uh, type of immunosuppression. And um, you can see here the cyclosporine, azathioprine, the, the red, um, and all the age groups does seem to have the highest risk. Um, the, the yellow catecholamic and uh, cyclophenolate has the lowest, and that you're seeing a trend is going towards catecholamic cyclophenolate. Um, these are probably the three major areas where um, we need um, infection prophylaxis. Um, we look at TMV. Acidulis and pneumocystis. Um, TMV prophylaxis, um, the highest risk for the donor is CMV positive. The recipient is negative. That means they don't have preformed antibodies to CMV, and now you're basically giving them CMV infection from the donor lungs. Um, and, and so that, that's where the prophylaxis is probably most important. Um, and those patients, um, because they still haven't developed an antibody response, at any point when you stop their prophylaxis, they then are at high risk of developing an invasive or active disease. Um, so often, um, at least by using prophylaxis, you can delay that time period where, um, for instance, a year after the transplant, they can be on lower amounts of immunosuppression um, and may have fewer other problems. And we may be able to handle if they uh, get breakthrough CMV. Um, other people will sometimes have things in the primary mismatch, give them a lifetime prophylaxis. One of the problems with that is um, sometimes with the emergence of gancyclovir resistance and CMV, which can then be problematic. Um, and th this is basically, you know, we, we typically at uh, our institution start with IV gancyclovir in the immediate post-op period, and then use oral val gancyclovir. Um, Cytogam, which is a anti-CMV IgG or immune globulin. Um, that uh, probably was used more frequently in uh, prior years. Um, some of the data on that uh, seems to show that it doesn't make a difference um, in that the efficacy of gancyclovir, valgancyclovir is so good that uh, usually the addition of cytogam isn't necessary and is somewhat cumbersome. Um, and uh, something that uh, in recent years has been available is quantitative PCR. So what we can do is um, when the patient's uh, off of prophylaxis, we can actually do surveillance and uh, monitor for CMV replication in the blood. And uh, if, we, um, if we start detecting CMV replication at a high enough level, uh, we would consider those patients at risk of developing active or invasive disease. And often we can at that time put them on preemptive therapy where they may go back on uh, valgancyclovir um, for treatment at that time. Um, aspergillus um, is, is going to be a huge problem in the lung. Um, it uh, sometimes can uh, cause infection after anastomosis. Um, it's a bronchial anastomosis. There's very poor blood supply, and um, it, it can be very problematic to get aspergillus infection there. Um, you can also get uh, invasive aspergillosis. You can get disseminated aspergillosis. Um, the most common uh, prophylaxis actually used is aerosolized infoterracin, and probably the biggest advantage of that is that um, it uh, will give you, you know, very good levels at an anastomosis. When you try using uh, drugs like itraconazole, especially, or, or even boriconazole, um, because of poor blood supply and anastomosis, often uh, you don't get adequate levels there. Although um, the aerosolized amphotericin, you know, may not uh, protect against that uh, disseminated aspergillosis, although I think in most cases the uh, portal of entry is the lung, so often it, it seems like um, for the most part it is successful. Um, liposomal amphotericin has actually um, been replacing kind of your standard amphotericin, uh, deoxycholate. Um, it seems that it's much longer lasting, whereas one dose of aerosolized liposomal amphotericin can be protective for almost two weeks, whereas um, with the standard amphotericin, it usually has to be administered two to three times daily. So even with a higher cost, um, because of the less frequent administration, 
um, and that's simply what you need. Um, and then pneumocystis prophylaxis, that's pretty much uh, universal in all, all patients. Um, you know, there are some issues when they're um, allergic to sulfa drugs. Um, sometimes we'll try desensitization, um, but um, there are some other um, alternatives. Um, finally, um, just looking at outcomes, I'll go over these things uh, briefly. Um, you know, as far as rejection, um, we showed uh, kind of previously um, about 30 35 percent experienced some rejection during the first year. Fortunately, uh, most of the time that's actually um, very responsive to high doses of steroids. Typical protocol might be insolumedrol, you know, one gram a day for three days, and that in most cases will clear up the rejection. At times, it's refractory rejection where um, if you have multiple courses of steroids, you may end up using more potent drugs like the anti-thymus night clobulin or even CAMPATH. This just um, looks at uh, kind of the same thing um, based on CMV status. It really doesn't make a difference for rejection. Um, uh, bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome, um, basically is the way we diagnose it um, is by monitoring FEV1. And uh, we look at a current FEV1 relative to peak post-transplant FEV1. Typically, we see gradual improvement in lung function over the first six months post-op. And at that point, the FEV1 may plateau at a certain level. And then we continue to follow that. And um, if at some point, as we see, if we see the FEV1 declining, we then we'll look at current FEV1 as a percentage of the prior peak. Once that drops below 80% of your prior peak, if you've excluded other causes of acute um, uh, lung injury or disease, um, and it's persistent, um, that will uh, actually meet the criteria of bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome. It's called a syndrome because we don't actually have pathology. We're taking we do take transplantal biopsies on a regular basis to look for rejection. The problem is transplantal biopsies um, don't get enough tissue usually to identify bronchiolitis obliterans. So basically we see syndrome because we uh, diagnose it kind of by exclusion and default. It's a common diagnosis and if we've excluded other reasons for declining lung function, it's so common in these patients. Um, actually, if you look at uh, by five years, almost 50% of the patients have developed some degree of bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome. So um, just looks at a few other things, um, you know, that uh, occur. Uh, renal uh, uh, hypertension is extremely common. Um, the uh, drugs like Prograf and cyclosporine will cause hypertension. They also um, can cause a kidney injury. Um, that, that's very common. You see uh, hyperlipidemia. Um, probably the reason for more hyperlipidemia um, in the uh, more recent era is the use of uh, rapidine and virolimus uh, that actually causes uh, hyperlipidemia. Um, you see 20-25% uh, to 25%, uh, uh, diabetes within one year. And even uh, within the first year, um, almost 10% have developed some bronchiolitis obliterans. And um, then this um, just looks at uh, some of the uh, same thing, but then um, at five years, you see almost all your patients will have some hypertension after five years of cyclosporine or Prograf. Um, and at least some renal dysfunction um, may, may not be trending greater than 2.5 but over half your patients after five or more years of the uh, calcineurin inhibitor or cyclosporine or Prograf will have some renal dysfunction. You see a lot of hyperlipidemia, a lot of diabetes, and uh, by that point you can see over 40% have developed bronchiolitis obliterans. Um, here, um, now we're looking at, at 10 years, um, you can see uh, almost 75% have developed some renal dysfunction and over 60% have some bronchiolitis obliterans. This looks at uh, malignancies and freedom from malignancies. And actually, that can become a problem with longer survival. Um, the immunosuppression regimens do put you at higher risk of developing cancers. And um, so you can and see here, um, so all malignancies, skin cancers are actually what we see uh, most, most commonly. And um, that, those, those numbers actually um, become pretty significant uh, over the years when you get to 10 year 
Uh, this just looks at a uh, functional status here of surviving recipients, and, and you really see a huge range. These are uh, Karnofsky scores. Um, you know, some patients, you know, can be doing extremely well, do not do work, and uh, can go to school, um, pretty much uh, do almost anything they want. But then uh, you see the whole gamut. Um, and again, you know, when we're looking at lung transplant candidates, it becomes very difficult to tell them what to expect because there's such a huge range. You know, uh, a number of patients will do extremely well and have a 100% Karnofsky score, whereas a lot of them here, you know, will be, uh, you know, 70% or lower. So um, it, it really can be difficult to predict outcomes. Um, let's look at employment status. Um, so you can see here at one year, um, between not working and retired, um, that ends up being the bulk of the patients. Um, by even, even by five years, um, still not even 40% will be working. Um, and a lot of that, though, um, you know, is often often by choice. Um, if they're not working, uh, it does you know take a fair amount of effort to uh, manage and take care of lung transplants, especially if you have complications. But on the other hand, um, it seems like the patients who want to work. Um, actually you know, we have a number of patients who want to get back to their job and they do and uh, they're successful at it. And just looking at uh, overall survival and this data including all transplants going back to 1990 you can see uh, median survival it's actually you know 5.6 years um, and, and again you can see a pretty broad broadband uh, but uh, there are you know a significant number of uh, patients even at 10, 10 plus years that are still alive, probably up to one out of three. Um, and then this is uh, here is conditional on survival at one year. So if your patient um, survives the first year, there is actually a 50% chance that they will live at least eight years by the end. Um, look at survival by era. You, you can actually see here that in the early 90s, uh, survival rates were lower. Um, a number of factors that may go into this, but uh, we are seeing um, you know, this e even uh, in the 2005 6 to 2012 is the era since the lung allocation score was developed that I've seen um, a little bit better survival rates even compared to 98 to 04. And then and this finally is uh, you know, different causes of death. Uh, bronchiolitis essentially refers to uh, the bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome, so that uh, still ends up being the you know, at later years, the most common cause of death. Um, you know, malignancy gradually rises over time. And um, so in the early period, primary graft failure, and then also infections, um, especially um, in that first year, infections can be pretty significant. And that's it. Yes, um, so lung volume reduction surgery is still uh, still done. Um, and, uh, you know, it's an area where, you know, again, we're looking, we kind of have to have patients that, you know, they have to be sick enough to warrant the surgery, not too sick. So we, we do, you know, we look at the criteria that came out during the NET trial. Um, definitely, you know, we look for patients whose COPD is heterogeneous and upper lobe predominant. Um, and the problem I've found is that a lot of surgeons, and you know, this is kind of a generalization, would prefer is if those patients are sicker, end up preferring lung transplant, and and rightfully so. Um, they definitely saw in the net trial that um, some some factors like diffusion capacity less than twenty percent predicted FEV one less than twenty percent predicted uh, mortalities were too high with lung volume reduction. So those patients. You know, definitely are not candidates for lung volume reduction. It's, um, you know, the, the ones kind of in the middle where, you know, maybe their FEV1, you know, 30 or 40 percent are predicted. They have heterogeneous disease, it's upper lobe predominant. Those patients will probably benefit from lung volume reduction surgery. And then even with lung volume reduction surgery, that doesn't preclude them from having a transplant at a later time. Um, I think the problem we often find out, not just finding patients with the right degree of severity, where they think their disease is severe enough to warrant 
surgery, but it's not so severe that they would need a transplant. You look for that group, and then they also have to be upper lobe predominant. They can't be diffuse disease. Um, uh, we always require that they go through at least 12 weeks of pulmonary rehab. Um, so, you know, the numbers kind of kind of shrink down, but um, you know, it's something that uh, definitely has you know in certain patients, you know, definitely can be beneficial. Um, you know, we'll, we'll often see uh, referrals of COPD patients who are referred for possible lung volume reduction or lung transplant, and you know, often um, you know we'll you know we may work work them up, look at uh, some of the details, and try and decide you know if one or the other procedure might be better for them. Questions?